Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Series 4, Episode 3 of Complex Cases. I'm Dan Morris, Intermediate Sales Director, and today, as always, I'm joined by two industry experts. We have the one and only tax wizard, John McCaffrey from Alexander & Co. Good morning, John. Good morning, fella. And then we have the guy who doesn't need any introduction, um, been in the industry since time began, Roger Morris. Morning. Morning, Dan. Morning, John. And morning, everybody else. Yes, good morning. And it is a good morning. The sun is slightly shining. We are um, feeling summery and the Euros have kicked off. So yeah. not bad, not not a bad week so far. And uh, for those of you that are returning, thank you and, and welcome. Thank you for coming back and for making these sessions and series amazing. And for those of you that are joining for the first time, you are in for a treat today. So with these sessions, as always, there's no format. There's no agenda. We want live questions from you, whether it's around mortgages, bridging, whatever, in terms of the market, or if you've got any tax-specific questions, which, let's be honest, this is a tax-focused webinar, then please do ask anything. And I do mean anything because John is just a wealth and a fountain of knowledge and not to put him on the spot, but brilliant at what he does. So please do make it as interactive as possible. And we do have some pre-asked questions as well, which is brilliant. So thank you for those that have sent these in prior. So let's get stuck in. Um, how are you guys? How's it been? Obviously, we met two months ago. We did the last one two months ago. As always, a lot has changed. We've got a, a looming election, which is going to be quite interesting for, for the market, shall we say. But how's it been? So I'll go over to, to you first, John. Um, yeah, as you say, um, all change. But just don't know what the changes are yet, fella. It's um, election been announced. People are throwing the policies out there at the moment. Uh, Labour is staying particularly quiet and non-comment like on capital gains tax. Um, so that's the bit that's interesting me at the moment. There's also rumours of about uh, capital gains tax free disposals for landlords selling to tenants. We'll see. Um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. Just can't plan yet. That's it. I think the key word, and it always is, and it has been for the past few years, interesting. But interesting. we adapt, don't we? We adapt, you get it, and then you get ahead of it, and you you serve the needs of your clients. It's as simple as that. And uh, Roger, what about yourself? Dan, the last, um, over the last couple of months, we've been planning these four specialist by -let webinars we've been doing in conjunction with Crystal and Financial Reporter, um, tomorrow, John's joining me because tomorrow's is on tax, Dan. We've got about 500 brokers registered. Um, and we're going to, what we'll be doing is is afterwards, um, those that want, the Crystal team will be ringing up and then being able to help them with those cases. So a real big focus on that bike let education is definitely what's been occupying my time. But Dan, over the last couple of months, I have seen so much of you on social media, the awards you've won, um, and also how you seem to become at the forefront when it comes to bridging commercial and specialist lending. Just give us a bit of a flavour of what the last couple of months have been like for you, because you certainly have been in in the, in the media eye from for many good reasons. Yeah, no, th thank you for that. Thank you for that. I mean, first and foremost, obviously, the series that you are doing and you, you are doing tomorrow, this is just, a, should we say, it's a warm up for that, really. So people will get a flavour around the content and ultimately you can join for the main event tomorrow. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, it's been busy for the past few months. To be honest, I think it's it's our market, and we are coming into our own because everyone, every network, every club, and and every firm and and broker are banging the drum around diversity now. So it's a case of look, people do the mainstream vanilla residential and buy to let, but it's how can we and and how can you add value to your clients from a diversity point of view, whether it's commercial or and we'll discuss in a second, but. Landlords are having to be challenged in terms of their thought processes and the asset classes that they're purchasing at the moment. Because if you do have a seasoned investor, people are stepping away from your standard three bed semis with a family in or a, a terraced house. And again, this will come at John's sweet spot around the taxation and the implications of certain asset classes. But we're seeing a lot more brokers diversify into these offerings because they're getting challenged by their clients, which again, um, if you're not helping that client, which you've helped previously, guess what? They'll go elsewhere and any business that you've had from them will disappear. So mm. it's just all about helping people never miss an opportunity. And as much as this isn't about how Crystal can help, it's all about just answering and being um, Switzerland in terms of the conversations that we're having today. 
there's certainly an increase in brokers that are utilizing packages and actually adding a package to to their arsenal because we are and we want brokers to be a Swiss Army knife and not say no to any opportunities. And the main thing from these sessions, it's just about who you've got in your corner and who's in your circle and and what value the people around you can add to your business. Obviously, we've diversified into um, ancillary offerings, so tax reclaim, and we are going to start to work closely with John soon um, from a taxation point of view because we value Alexander and Co's business and, and the um, knowledge that they have within the sector, really. So it's just about if a customer comes into your shop, how can you keep them in your shop? They come in for one thing, and you might not be able to offer that, but it's utilising the people around you to enable that offering. So it's kind of as simple as that. But in a nutshell, in a word, it's busy. We are busy. If people t if people say the market's flat, they're lying. It's just knowing where to look for business. For me, it's as simple as that. Lenders could fund a bit more, if I'm honest with you. Um, yeah, yeah being particularly picky, and we've had a few questions asked around lenders being picky and declining after dip and stuff. But there's still appetite out there for the customers, is what I'd say. So if you're not busy, it's looking about diversifying and where can you get your next business from. That, Dan, just on that point, because I don't think you can, uh, it's grabbed my attention and I'm sure lots of the other people are on tax reclaim. So you've you've said it, I, I, I don't think you can move on from that without explaining a bit more because that's a, a really powerful subject and it grabs my attention. So can you just allude a bit more about that? Because I have heard you talk about that many times. Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, this relates to commercial transactions, but it's just utilising um capital allowance i believe is that right john yeah from a tax reclaim point of view so john will understand this a little bit more than me because well he's qualified to, to, to give this advice ultimately but when a customer or a, a client comes to us for a commercial purchase we will look at that transaction on an individual level and, and and find a home from a mortgage point of view but we'll also look to utilize the capital allowance so they can actually claim some tax back or get it deducted off the next tax bill so i mean john you might be able to give a bit more meat on the bones from there you've got to be really careful on commercial property to be honest dan um history to this and it changed it a few years back what used to happen is you could buy a commercial property and within that commercial property are um you've got your structure you're building um which you only get relief on when you sell it but within that um, if you're using that commercial property in a business in some way, shape or form, so that could be a trade or a rental business or something like that, there are things like your, your, your toilets, your bathrooms, your wiring, your heating systems, that kind of thing. And they qualify for relief from tax through capital allowances, which is a specific tax deduction available for those kind of assets. Years ago, what used to happen was somebody would sell a building and put all the proceeds down to the property um, because if they put it down to those assets, they get taxed more because they'd already had some relief on it. But the purchaser would have a look at the property, get somebody in to do a bit of a survey and go, well, 80% belongs to the building, but 20% belongs to these allowances and they claim tax relief. And you have a mismatch between the vendor and the seller. Sorry, the vendor and the purchaser. Since 2012, right? So the tax reclaim is really important. But since 2012, it's really important to pick up this point in the property transaction. OK. As part of the property transaction, the seller and the purchaser have to agree the amount that goes to these assets out of the consideration, right? And the seller has to have had these assets in their tax computation. And if that's not there, then the purchaser can't subsequently claim the tax relief on it. The relief can be up to 100% in the first year. And if it's not 100% in the first year, then you're looking at either 18 or 8% year on year tax deduction. So well worth having. Perfect. And would you say this is well known within the, the, the industry or the, the property sector? Or would you say it's it a, a should be well known, but it's so, so rarely uh, used. The amount of commercial property transactions I've seen where people still don't pick up on it. And it, it's a massive it's a massive area for lawyers, actually. If they don't pick up on it on the transaction, there's, there's definitely a grounds for um, suing on it. Interesting. Interesting that. And, and again, it's, it's something that we've not explored previously. And thank you for 
trying that out because, um, well, again, you are the expert. But again, it's just adding that next layer to to to, to that transaction and that that mm -hmm. client ultimately. So how about look, we've done this for you, but actually let's look at this part for you, the tax element, and we'll save you twenty, thirty, fifty, whatever thousand pounds. Yeah. It's a simple question from a broker, Gavin. Have you thought about your capital allowances? Hundred percent. And again, if you're not if you're not qualified to give that advice, which most people won't be, if I'm honest with you, um, and certainly giving this advice, it's very niche from the people that we've spoken to. Then just have a partner you can refer it to because how good is that to you? Look, I've I've done this, and actually you've saved me this sort of money. So guess what? On the next transaction, you're getting my business. I'm going to refer my pals because I've got that full concierge service. It, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's just about thinking how much can you get out of that particular client and how many solutions can you fulfill from them? It's, it's as simple as that. Dan, so Dan, Dan I, I was asked this question. I got asked this morning before I come on that I thought was quite a good one to put to you and John. And it was about with buy to let Dan, that a lot of lenders have got this tailoring against low rate and high fees. So you've got low rate with um, a 7% fee or a 5% fee or a three, three and a half even as low as a two. So you've got the options. Um, and it was just to get your views on it, Dan, and your views on it, John, because I believe in personal names, lender fees are treated the same way as interest, but in a limited company, you can offset 100% of the lender's fees in that right. type of return. I get that asked at the moment so much, but with you being the subject matter experts, Dan, you dealing from a lender point, and John, you from a tax point, um, it's just been asked, could could you both maybe just explain your views on on what either what you're seeing, Dan, uh, how many conversations you have around this, and John, just from a tax point of view, just quantify that. That's the only question I'd brought on today. Yeah, hundred percent, and it, it all stems down to to the interest rates and the, the source market. Ultimately, you can't lend money out for for cheaper than you're getting it in. It's kind of as simple as that. And these higher higher fee, low rates. Uh, um, options for clients kind of counter that the, the swaps market and where it's at ultimately because lenders still need to make money but also need to make it affordable from a stress testing point of view for clients to to get the loan amounts that you want unfortunately it is a necessary evil if i'm honest with you so whether i agree with it or not it's just a way to to get around the system for the lenders to make the money they need to to better lend the money out and the clients to get the loan amounts that they need um ultimately so yeah, um, we are. Have we seen a big uptake ourselves in terms of the higher fees? It, I can't give you a simple answer on that. It's, it really depends on the serviceability, ultimately, from the client. So all I'd say is they are there to serve a purpose, and we are seeing traction with these higher fees, lower rates. But, again, it's all about balance. And similar to when you're doing a residential mortgage in terms of do you pay a fee or do you not pay a fee, is it going to be beneficial over that five-year period? Right, okay, it is or it isn't. But the main thing is, if people are wanting to get max LTV out of the properties at 75%, sometimes they have to take these higher fees to enable the stress tests to work. So I think it's something that's not going to go away anytime soon, if I'm honest with you. I think obviously if base rate does stabilise, you may see a slight reduction or less clients having to take these ones with the higher, higher fees. But ultimately, it is a product that's viable for clients in certain situations, if I'm honest. So I would say don't discount them and and also you say, well, 7% is too high, which we're not living in the world that we used to, unfortunately. I mean, a residential mortgage of 1%, imagine that. It's things like Together, everyone knows Together. They were offering 3.59 a couple of years ago. 3.59 with Together with their quirky criteria, phenomenal. You'd bite, you'd bite someone's hand off now for that on a residential mortgage, wouldn't you? So it's all relative to our situation. But I think these higher fees, lower rates, are there to serve a purpose. It's just all about validating whether it's, right for the client but i would say don't discount them and don't be turned away because guess what 12 months ago when you were getting offered rates at seven percent you've got not not a chance clients won't go for that but guess what they are because we're, we're climatizing to what is the new norm and what the norm should have been previously we've got to remember that a lot of people within the sector now have only ever advised when times have been good and it's been a case of do you want a, do you want a fixed rate or do you want a longer fixed rate and that's been it that's the conversation you've had right brilliant let's get it wrapped up now it's a case of brokers are actively having and i feel sorry for them are having to actually earn or work for the money a lot harder 
whether that's doing PTs, but having a duty of care to the client to do it not once, not twice, but maybe five times, depending on what's on Twitter that day or um, what's in the tabloids. Um, and now it's all a case of, do you want fixed? Do you want longer fixed? Do you want tracker? Do you want discount? Do you want variable? Are we going to extend your term from an affordability point of view? So there's so much more to think about, but this is just another tool in the toolbox, which again, has to be utilized when there's a need. John, from a taxation point of view, um, I I appreciate I did go on for a little bit there, but again, it's a it's a topic which people do keep bringing up around. They so do. Over to you. No worries. So on a outside limited company basis, there's a distinction to be drawn between whether your property is commercial or residential. Okay, so if there are fees attaching to um, residential. As with interest, there is a restriction on the deductibility of those fees. The most you will ever get is a 2010 deduction on the cost of those fees um, knocked off your profits for tax purposes. On commercial, um, it, it doesn't matter. You would get a full deduction on commercial. There's no restriction on landlords on commercial properties. Um, in a limited company, um, limited companies are governed by um, what's snappily called the loan relationship rules and by and large your tax deduction follows your accounting treatment so to the extent that you get a accounting deduction for your interest and finance costs you will correspondingly get a tax deduction and there'll be no restriction on that interesting thank you very much and whilst we're on the subjects of that and landlords and asset classes and fees etc so as mentioned we're seeing a lot more professional landlords diversify their asset classes purely from a yield point of view so as mentioned the typical type of properties that people are purchasing now i wouldn't say that they're dying but people are looking to, to get the best yield possible obviously we've had the taxation changes we've had interest rates rising so yields have been dropping um we're seeing a lot more professional landlords diversify into commercial properties semi-commercial properties holiday lets airbnbs is there a difference for from a tax point of view if there's a commercial element and is there any benefits to a, an investor to purchase something with a commercial element rather than full residential yeah, there's well, it's I mean, it's it's I mean, as with all my advice, Dan, it's very much dependent on the circumstances. But for commercial properties, the tax treatment is very, very different. Um, so if you um purchase commercial property, um, or a mixed use property with a commercial element, your stamp duty is then based on the commercial rates of stamp duty, right. And that basically means that your first 150,000 is free, your next 100,000 is at 2%, and then everything thereafter is at 5%, okay? Now this may or may not be beneficial, and in a lot of cases it may actually currently be more beneficial because you may or may not be aware that from the 1st of June, um, multiple dwellings relief was removed, okay? Yeah. And that means that if you are a purchaser of multiple residential properties, previously your stamp duty was based on the average price of the property. Now it's based on the collective price of the property and you find yourself going up into the higher echelons of the stamp duty, you know, the 12 to 15% rates at a, at a much faster rate. If you can argue or find that you've got a commercial element to the um, purchase, then your rates capped at five percent across everything. So on bigger transactions, um, having a commercial um, property is um, definitely definitely better from a stamp duty point of view. Um, from other taxes, um, as I said just now, interest and financing costs are fully deductible in your own name are on commercial properties, not on residential properties. And the capital gains tax rate on commercial properties is 20% currently in your own name, whereas residential properties is 24%. Right. Within companies, it evens out a whole lot more, um, except for the fact that the stamp duty rates are still different. So residential rates, residential stamp duty is still charged at residential rate of stamp duty on the collective amount, unless you buy more than six and you can elect for the commercial rates to apply. Whereas in a company, 
you pay corporation tax on your gains, all your interest is deductible, whether or not you have um, a commercial rate or not. Um, the other thing to factor in with commercial property occasionally is VAT. So unlike residential property, you can do what's called opting to tax. Now you might, if you buy a commercial property and it is opted to tax, that means in most cases, the seller has to charge you VAT. And if you don't opt to tax, then you can't recover that VAT and you pay stamp duty on the VAT inclusive price. If you do opt to tax, then you can recover the VAT on the purchase, um, but then you've got to charge VAT on your rent, which may be all right if it's to a trading business and can recover it, but it's, only, it's, it's a problem if you um, can't do that. Um, the other reason you might opt to tax a property is if you are doing a very large refurb on a commercial property and you want to recover all your input VAT on the refurb, um, you can, in those circumstances, opt to tax, recover your input VAT. You need to be careful of any sales within 10 years at that point because you would have to charge VAT on the sale and you might get a clawback of the VAT you recovered. Um, if you've got a sale within 10 year period. So lots of differences, but commercial property at the moment, generally from an individual point of view, um, has a goodly number of better tax advantages. Okay, interesting. And again, that's not commonly known by investors. It's just a case of looking at, look, this is going to yield better for the money that I'm putting in. We'll have a bit of that. So if there's actual benefits from a tax point of view as well, then it is essentially a double win. Um, we've had this question asked, asked previously, but it has came in prior. And, and, and again, there is a number of new advisors that are up and coming in the market. We've certainly seen a, a number of entrants training and, and joining the bigger firms that we deal with. But if um, if properties are owned by, say, Mr. and Mrs. individuals, it's not viable to move them into a limited company. And this is the key part here. There's a higher rate taxpayer and there's a lower rate taxpayer that yeah. uh, the applicants, whatever. Is there any way of utilising tax allowances um, from an income point of view to, to maximise the income for these individuals from the buyers? There is. There is. So a couple of circumstances here. Let's say they've got joint ownership. So on joint ownership of property, the revenue take the view that no matter what that joint ownership is, um, each of them will be taxed 50-50 on the income from those properties. Um, even if you've got a sort of 99-1 arrangement, right? Unless you can demonstrate that the actual ownership is different, okay? So um, in the circumstance, it may be you own 199, but it might actually be beneficial, as you say, to go 50-50 to use the lower rate taxpayers' um, allowances. If you've got one, a situation where you've got a high rate taxpayer who owns 100% of the property and you've got a lower or non-taxpayer not owning anything, um, it's most definitely beneficial to transfer um, an interest to the lower rate tax spouse. Um, two ways you can do that. You can do a legal transfer whereby you actually convey it. Or you can do something called a deed of trust. Now, a deed of trust um, basically means for tax purposes that you transfer the beneficial interest under what's called a bear trust. And then the recipient then is um, entitled to uh, that level of income. Now, for tax purposes, you can't just transfer the income stream. You also need to transfer the capital value so that on a future disposal, that person would receive uh, the capital gains proceeds as well. Then what you need to do is submit what's called a Form 17 to the revenue together with the deed of trust or the conveyance. And it's only from the point of the submission of the Form 17 to the revenue that you can alter the income return um, on, on your tax returns. And another point to note is that in order for the, the, the lower paid spouse to get the interest relief on uh, mortgage payments, you would have to transfer either the actual mortgage obligation or the um, requirement 
pay the mortgage obligation. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they're not going to get the interest relief, which makes the whole thing a little bit pointless. Um, in those circumstances, transfers of debt can give rise to a stamp duty liability on the recipient spouse. Okay. If if the so let's say it's residential, if the transfer is more than two hundred fifty thousand, um, the higher rates, additional rate to stamp duty don't apply. But um, debt goes, stamp duty is paid on consideration given, and taken over debt is deemed to be consideration given. So yes, but yeah, perfect? that's how you utilize. Sorry, Dan. Sorry, is that is that per asset two hundred and fifty or is it combined assets? Um, no, it would be whatever you transfer. Right, okay. So if you transfer the whole portfolio and the debt you transfer is several million, then you do have a decent sized stamp duty land tax liability to pay. Perfect. I okay. suppose that in the main, Dan, because you're only the only value comes up to fifty grand worth of net income, less kind of the expenses, it, it you never see it with big loan sizes as much as the smaller where it's a few properties generally on that point. Dan, is it all right if we ask John just to quantify where the holiday let rules are? Because at the moment it's transitionary as whether or not Labour unwinds it because the holiday let rules don't come in for next year. But in the summary at the moment, if I have a holiday let, I can class my rateable value, potentially if it's commercial rateable value, let's say it's 12,000, I wouldn't pay any rates. And with a holiday let, I could, in effect, offset 100% of the interest relief. They were kind of the two biggies. And then the entrepreneur's relief, if they sell the property, yep. could you just remind everyone regarding where we are now and what is the likelihood change? I think it comes in, is it April next year with these changes? April 25, it's meant to come in, yeah. Um, I can't see it changing. Um, whichever government comes in. So at the moment, it's um, as it always has been. Um, your holiday let or your furnished holiday let regime is still in place. There are certain conditions you've got to meet to get the benefits of that regime in that the property must be furnished to uh, a certain standard and has got to be let out for a certain number of days, available a certain number of days and actually let out a certain number of days on short-term lettings. Um, you can claim capital allowances on your assets, like we talked about earlier. Um, if you sell your furnished holiday let business, you can um, claim up to a 10% rate of tax on the disposal rather than the 24% rate that you would pay normally on um, residential properties. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is if you breach the VAT threshold, which currently stands at 90 grand, you would have to register for VAT and charge VAT on your finished holiday let business. Um, that is all expected to come to an end uh, next April. Um, but for now, it stands. Um, and after next April, finished holiday lets will be treated um, like any other residential property. Perfect. That's uh again a wealth of knowledge and and holiday lets are certainly something that we're seeing more of and as mentioned the investors are are doing more of now. Holiday home and holiday let is very very different, isn't it? So investors <laughs> seem to or, or even certain brokers and individuals seem to see it as the the same sort of thing. A holiday home, just to clarify, is your home, second home, from a mortgage point of view. Do you know what? You have to use your income, including the outgoings, etc. Holiday let is, for all intents and purposes, a business, isn't it? It's an investment. You get money from it. You pay Correct. tax. With a holiday let, John, are the individuals able to utilize this um, when they want to? And it's not it's not to carry out maintenance works or anything like that. Are they able to stay in the holiday let themselves? And if so, are there any tax implications off the back of it? Right. So it depends how it's owned. Okay. So as I was saying before, an actual holiday let to meet the, and it's called the furnished holiday let regime, right? Has to be available. Roger knows these figures better than me. I never remember them. I think it's 210 days a year. 
And I think it needs to be actually let out 105 days a year. Right. And that varies and according to which of the devolved nations. So Wales is quite strict. So yeah. just to be clear, Dan, it, it the devolved nations have different rules and different definitions. Right. Now, if you own the holiday home let in your own name and you meet those conditions, you aren't actually prevented from using the property for your own use occasionally. OK. Um, if your own use is such that you don't meet those conditions, it's not a furnished holiday let and it's just taxed as a residential property. Yep. Yep. In a company, if you're a director of a company, um, your use of a company asset, because it belongs to the company, not you, your use of the company asset is a benefit in kind, and you would be subject to income tax on the value of your use for however long you used it, regardless of whether it met the furnished holiday let regime or not. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. There's no simple answer to that. It's down to the ownership structure. Yep. <laughs> And uh, whether you do meet the rules, ultimately. And we know Wales is, we, can we say awkward, different, stricter? Um, because obviously people purchasing holiday lets over in Anglesey, for example, are pushing the prices up for all the residents there, which isn't making it great for certainly first-time buyers getting on the, the property ladder. Roger, I'm going to flip the next question over to you because um, you've not had much today. So I'm going to give you a, a little bit of air time. Um, obviously, you've had a lender background for a number of years now. Um Julie Hardman's previously asked, why do lenders move the goalposts after application? By the way, this isn't a great question. Mm. Um, we've had several cases where the lender is given a positive dip, the full app has been made and valuation carried out, and then the lender declines because of credit profile. And this is on buy to let. So I would only ask Julie the first question, was there any variation or amendment to the client's um, sort of name, date of birth, or property address. Sometimes we have seen it where it was sort of the client has got a middle name and the dip was done and the middle name wasn't put in and it was just pulled further into the application, maybe off the stage, they put a middle name in and that's brought through a complete new data feed of adverse that's caused the case to decline. So the first one would be it's, it's absolutely imperative that the full um name as per the passport uh, as per the date of birth is is registered on the decision in principle the people will often say well what does the middle name matter it's that data recorded accuracy but when it comes to if if the information you put in is 100 percent accurate it's wrong that a lender would then incur detriment to the customer um at off the stage once the valuation has been done because of 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 known from day one credit information Dan, so I, I don't know which of the lenders it is, but the lenders I've worked for in the past, whether it be uh, Precise, whether it be Kent Reliance, whether it be Tandem, if the information that was put in correctly at the beginning, the lender would have all that insight, that decision. So I don't really understand how it would go gone through a past decision, Dan unless the full information wasn't given up front or, Dan, or on buy to let. What can happen is if you've got multiple properties, is it can pull through on manual underwriting further information that then detects that. Let's just say, Dan, we're doing an application for you. You've got a property in Middlesbrough, you've got properties in Dalit and Stockton, you've got them all over. And the automated data feed just pulls through the credit file from your residential address, say in Stockton. What then happens when you do the full manual underwrite and some lenders will instruct valuation automatically up front with the decision in principle asking if the client's got any CCJs or defaults what then happens, Dan, is you had a tenant that moved out 18 months ago in Middlesbrough. The council weren't informed. You didn't pick up, for whatever reason, paying your rates. And then the council's put a CCG against you. That's sometimes you can see where 
there's multiple properties or linked properties and it's not until you do that manual assessment do you find that information that's the only other example I can see and I do feel for the lender in that one because the lender wouldn't know um, and it was for the applicant to explain that information so the applicant should always make sure any linked addresses any buy let properties that are owned that there's a full communication strategy for anybody trying to obtain finances and will follow through. Perfect. Thank you very much. And hopefully that clarifies, but it also shows the importance of one getting it right first time. Middle names as well. Middle names, because it can cause all sorts of problems. We've seen that. Um, so no, thank you for that insight. And John, there's a, and a question that's came in from anonymous, uh, an anonymous attendee. Mm -hmm. which is an interesting one. Um, perfectly legal, but interesting. So I have a house I live in, in my limited company name. Yep. Um, what is the best way to take it out of the company? Right. So, yeah, I had a quick read of that when it popped up, and, uh, and I don't wish to scare the living shit out of it on this, <laughs> on this attendee. But come on to that. I'll just give a little bit of background. So if you live in a house in a limited company, you're benefiting kind based on an absolute pig of a calculation, based around some ancient rateable values of the property. Um, it's really expensive. Secondly, if the house is worth more than 500,000, you have what's called an annual tax on an envelope dwelling. So this is an annual tax charge you have to pay based on the value of the house over to the revenue and it tends to go up by 250, 500,000 increments. Um, Thirdly, you're so currently, and I'm hoping it stays this way, currently when you sell your own home, it's free from capital gains tax. Not the case when it's in a company. So regardless if you used it as your main residence, the company will pay capital gains tax on the disposal of that property. Right. That all said, getting it out um, under some practical requirements as to how possible this is. Um, you either need to buy it out and it needs to be at market value because you are connected with the company because you own it, right? And if it's not at market value, the revenue will infer market value. Um, the company will have capital gains tax and you will pay stamp duty land tax on the value of that property. Um, if you don't buy it out and the company transfers it to you, um, at, le at the very least, you will be taxed on the receipt of a dividend at income tax rates at up to 40%, just shy of 40%. And if the company hasn't got what's called reserves out of which you can pay dividends, um, it's likely to be deemed to be a bonus. And in those circumstances, you will suffer national insurance and income tax, both employees and employers, All right? So if it's possible, the best way of getting it out of the company is to liquidate the company. And that gives rise to what's called a capital distribution. Now the company still has a capital gain that it needs to pay, but you are deemed to receive that property as a capital distribution, which is subject to capital gains tax at 20%. Um, though, and you may, and I need to check this, sorry, you may not have to pay the stamp duty land tax because it's received by a way of dividend. Well, I hope the anonymous attendee was sat down for that. Um, certainly a lot to take in, but again, brilliant answer, John, and, and, and very for us. So, Obviously, we don't know the circumstances as to why that individual is living in it. Obviously, I'm, 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 as mentioned, it's perfectly legal. You can rent a property off a limited company and live in it yourself, um, even owning the limited company. However, it does bring a rise and cause headaches as to, to what John mentioned there if you were to dispose of it or transfer it to individual ownership. So hopefully that's given you a bit of food for thought. If you need some tax advice, there's a brilliant guy just there that can uh, give you that advice. Um, but yeah, hopefully it answered your question. We've got another anonymous question. So no one wants to show the name and face today. Um, do we have lenders who can accept renting their property out to companies providing care to young people? So I'll obviously feel this one. John might have a, 
in input and so might like Raj, but yes, we do. Yes, we do. The market is very, very limited. So the market's very, very limited for renting to this sort of client because it does pose reputational risk. If the property was to ever need to be repossessed for whatever reason, kicking out young people, sick elderly, whatever, it doesn't pose well in the media. So anything where there's going to be reputational risk or there's potentially um, vulnerable clients in the property, a lot of lenders do not like. There are a number of lenders out there that do it. And selfishly, from an individual point of view, if you're owning a property and renting it to either a charity or, or this sort of purpose, it does yield really, really well, um, weirdly. So there are lenders out there that will do it, but you will tend to pay um, the higher end of the scale from an interest point of view. Similar to, to care homes and stuff like that, there's been a lot in the press over the years around care homes, um, the service and how, how clients are treated. So that again, the market is limited for that. Similar to if you if it's a place of worship, if there's something with community ties, anything that poses big reputational risk, a lot of lenders will not entertain. But same as anything within the specialist market, rate reflects the risk. And if there's higher risk there or higher reputational potential damage there, then you're just going to pay a little bit more. But there's always a solution for a client. It's just a case of if and where um, you will place it. But we do have options and we have done a number of these in all fairness. So, yes. Um, anything from anyone else on that? Are we happy to move on? No, I think, Danny, you got that spot on. The, the courts, particularly uh, when it comes to a possessory position, if there's any form of vulnerability, literally just will not uh, allow that um, that eviction to take place. And as you said, you, I think you encompass all the lenders that will consider that uh, asylum seekers and um, sort of refuge homes. They're the sort of three big areas. So I think you, Crystal certainly has that area well covered. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Next one from another anonymous attendee. Um, is it classed as subletting if it's rented out to a limited company running it as a business? So I think that relates back to one of the previous questions. And was that the residential job, meaning is it classed or is, it, is that one class to um, vulnerable, vulnerable kids? Um, I'm not really sure which one that would relate back to. Yeah, I mean, you, you could put a little bit more meat on the bones there if you can. Um, but it, it depends on what, what type of property it is, in all fairness, from my point of view. So if it's a limited company that owns a commercial that then rents it to a... I know it's vulnerable, Dan. So in other words, if you have a property, um, is it classed as subletting if it's rented to a limited company that's running a business to 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 the vulnerable children? Um, no, I would say no. I'd say it's just it, it we done on a commercial basis rather than your standard buy to let basis. So similar to any commercial, if you own a property type, whether it's a a residential property or commercial property for all intents and purposes, if it is rented to a business, then it'd just be classed in theory as commercial. So you'd just be charged commercial rates or there or thereabouts. But no, it wouldn't be classed as subletting. Subletting would be me renting it to you to then rent out on Airbnb. That and, sort of format. And Dan, I think also possibly what the, the person asking the question, and we'll call it anonymous uh, 11.13. Um, if if you think that possibly you've got a property, but if you rent it to a limited company and the limited company is your tenant and that limited company then puts in vulnerable people, it kind of watches it through. But your terms and condition of every mortgage lender will stipulate who and who can and cannot reside in the property. So as the vast majority of buy let lenders won't allow this, if you actually did do that, you would be in breach of your terms and conditions. And if something untoward happened in the property, you also wouldn't be insured because it was a breach of your terms and conditions. So I think the simple answer is ring Dan and speak to Crystal with that type of, uh, of customer. Danny, I just want to ask you this one, because this is one for you. Can a second charge bridge, so I've got a second charge bridge on my property that Crystal have put into place. Do you offer, subject to status, uh, LTV and criteria, can you and have you converted that to a second charge term mortgage? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. So with that, if we're putting a second charge bridge on a, on a property or a number of properties, we just need to be confident with the exit. So if it's a case of, look, the... We need to understand why they'd have a bridge in place first anyway um, and why they haven't gone straight to term loan. But if it's a case they need the money quickly, then absolutely fine. 
and we can do it. But yeah, it, it's no different to you um, remortgaging a client on a first charge basis. So obviously with second charge term loans, there is, or, or they are more relaxed, lenders are more relaxed in terms of criteria and income multiples. So you've got the benefits of that there and it's a really brilliant tool. But in terms of repaying it to a term loan, then yeah, absolutely fine. Dead easy, dead easy. It's no different as long as it stacks up. But if you were to put a client or a second charge bridge on a property for a client and the exit was going to be refinanced a second charge, we'd need to make sure we can exit it day one. Um, and that's on the first charge basis as well. So yeah, dead easy. And if it's a case if you've got a client that's currently got a second charge bridge, then absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you could even look at first charge options, but chances are they took a second charge bridge anywhere rather than a further advance or remortgage because they've got a brilliant first charge rate, which doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's dead easy, dead easy. Similar to, 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 to doing a, a first charge remortgage, really. Just look, a little bit more flexibility. But Dan, just, just a point on that on bridging. Um, I've seen more new bridging lenders come to the market in the last couple of weeks and so many uh, lining up to enter the sector. What's your viewpoint on the amount of new entrants, the size of the market now and, and capacity for all? And also the same with seconds, crystal to seconds as well. There's three new uh, interbridge um you've got admiral and there's another one there's at least three is it interbridge or interlord there's there's three or four second charge lenders coming through and bridging what, what's your view when it comes to marketplace specifically bridging related dan yeah i mean obviously we are a, a massive player in the bridging market i think everyone knows us for our bridging proposition and and what we can get and the fact that we will not be beating on bridging unless compliance are listening, then we won't be beating on regulated bridging. Um, but we've seen the market grow rapidly over the past few years. So if you look at the stats for 22, the market was 716 million. In 2023, the market finished on 831 million. So that's a huge, huge growth. And if you look at the different reasons for bridging finance, um, you've got a multitude of reasons now. I think the market, similar to a lot of the residential and bike markets previously, it is going to start to get saturated with, with with bridging lenders because it is seen as as quick and easy money. Obviously, that the market for, from a bridging point of view hasn't been massively impacted by the volatility of the the money market. If you look at a, a twelve month term, then you can still lend it out to similar to what you were pre Liz Trust, should we call it. Um, so the actual difference between term loans now versus bridging finance, it's negligible. We're seeing a lot of investors purchasing properties, not even at auction, via bridging, because they've got an anticipation of rates dropping. Um, it's just a case of when. So they're purchasing it via a bridge and ultimately um, edging the bets as to, to when rates do drop, which realistically we all are expecting. But some people are expecting them next month. Some people are expecting them next year. It really does depend. But I think bridging now more than ever the name that it's got is a lot better than it was previously. Sure, certainly if I say short-term finance rather than bridging finance, clients are more open to it. Mm -hmm. um, we've had this conversation before. And it's it, it's a necessary evil. It's a necessary evil. COVID taught us that what the only thing that seems to be more important than the money is, is, is time. And we are and don't have the luxury of time, do we? A lot of people know someone who, who died during COVID or lost family members themselves. So if you've got, for example, Nana and Grandad that want to move 200 miles back to, to be near the, the, the children and grandchildren and they found the dream home, rather than waiting for their property to go up for sale and go through the motions and find a buyer and then this dream home disappear, they're actually using it, bridging them on as chain break to get back up to, to seeing the kids and seeing the grandkids and then letting the property sell when it sells. So we're seeing more and more reasons for, for people to be using bridging finance and i think the market is going to grow again this year we've certainly seen an uplift in brokers sending us their first bridge that they've never done holding the hand and just getting them i suppose bridge confident really so it certainly does have a place in the market and it's helpful that it's lucrative as well so it's kind of a win-win um in terms of the in terms of the new lenders yeah i mean we're not <sighs> Certainly with our panel, it's a well-established panel with lenders that we know that do business. So unless someone's going to come in and set the market alight, I don't think we're going to see a massive shift um, from the lenders that we use. And what I would say is if you are doing bridging, do your homework, do your homework, because there's some brilliant lenders out there and don't get caught up by the private investors that have all set up, want to lend a couple of quid, ask minimal questions because they will charge the earth. 
So utilize people that do have good experience and good relationships. And Dan, Dan thank you for that, because we are seeing a big lot. I think the next question is maybe for you and John, which was Carl Wood. Um, again, it goes back to this envelope dwelling, John and Dan. They've got a client looking to obtain a mortgage on a property owned by a limited company, which they live in. So they live in an unencumbered property owned within a limited company. Would uh, would you class this as regulated or non-regulated as it's owned by a limited company? <sighs> the argument is it's it's one of those areas, Dan, my experience of limited company lenders, the one thing where it's a consumer buy to let is one thing, but this isn't a consumer buy to let. This is someone's residential property where actually the beneficiary technically is the one living there. So John, Dan, this to me is not an easy one to find a lender to place. Right. I'll I'll pitch this first bit first, then John can chip in with his his inspirational words um, around tax. So, for all purposes on this, we would class it as as non regulated. It's a limited company that owns it. Whether it's a hundred percent shareholder director that's actually living in it, as long as they're paying market rent to the limited company, there are not all, but there are lenders that um, would do it. Is it a backdoor residential? You tell me, ultimately. I mean, it would be classed as a backdoor residential in theory, but if it's all above board and the lender's happy with it, then they will do it. So we do see a, lo a number of directors that do do this for whatever reason. I mean, John will be shaking his head thinking, well, it's a bit of a silly thing to do on, um, in the grand scheme of things. But we would class it as non-regulated. The regulator would obviously class it as non-regulated because it is owned, even though the um, individual is 100% shareholder director, but we can do it. It just needs to be stipulated day one so that we do find the right home for it. Um, some lenders that would do this case would possibly want to make sure that that individual could get a residential mortgage in their own name um, should they want to do it in their own name just to satisfy their requirements that it isn't um, a backdoor residential. And we just need to understand why they're purchasing it in this ownership structure. Uh, ownership structure which as John's mentioned previously, with a disposal of an asset like this, um, it is quite costly. So John, I'll pass it over to you now, but we'll class it as non-regulated in terms of from an individual point of view, but the market's limited. You're right. Owning your main residence through a company is a terrible idea. It's just a terrible idea. Um, so one, as you say, for the mortgage purposes, they need to pay market rent. If it is, it's got to be an arm's length market rent. Um, you would then have to check whether the benefit in kind in some way, shape, or form still applied um, to make and your mark your, your your rent would need to cover at least the benefit in kind value. Um, your rent goes in; it's subject to corporation tax. So you're putting money into your own home that you're then getting taxed. Um, your growth in the value of the property is taxable under corporation tax, not tax free. Uh, you pay more stamp duty when you acquire a property in a company. And depending on the value of the company, there is an annual tax on um, envelope dwellings, which regardless, so it's got to be 500 grand or more, regardless of the fact that you're paying rent because you are the owner of the company, that tax does arise. The only time owning a main residence through a limited company can be beneficial is if it is of such significant value that the inheritance tax charge outweighs all of those other tax charges. Can I just jump in on that there? So we had one recently. It was a property that was residential. Yeah. But on said property, because it was a, I mean, it wasn't of huge value. It was, it was two million pounds. Yeah. Um, but they were also going to run parts of it as a business. So do weddings there. There was converted barns. Um, yeah. With that sort of transaction, could it potentially mm -hmm. be beneficial to own a limited company? And would it depend on the percentage of that is residential versus commercial? Absolutely. It would absolutely depend on that. So because you're living there and, and it's it's your home, um, you you would, I mean, you pay rent. If you don't pay rent, you've got the benefit in kind charge. Depends on the value that is residential. Um, and there's nothing to prevent you doing split title. Um, from a tax point of view, your commercial elements can be kept in a company. The commercial elements of the property can be kept in a company and you can keep the residential bits outside of the company. Okay. 
perfect. Thank you. So again, it's not one size fits all, but there are other ways and means to do it, and you there are against it. For an individual, from an individual purchase in a residential and limited company, unless it was phenomenal. So let's say I purchased Buckingham Palace, you'd recommend putting that in a in a limited. There's company. a there's a there's a lot of extremely wealthy non domiciles who would purchase um, a hundred million pound property in a company because the inheritance tax would be forty million pounds. Well, I'm sure we'd all love a slice of that mortgage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That, that concludes today's session. So I think that went dead quick, if I'm honest with you. Um, so first and foremost, look, everyone that attended, thank you very much for, for the questions that you've, you've put to us. I know a lot of them were anonymous, which I like the mystery behind that. But as always, we like to make these things different. We like to have questions that aren't pre-asked. There's no script. Let us think on our feet. Obviously, John's just showcased, again, that he is the star attraction. He is the tax wizard. He is the show pony. Um, and you are in safe hands where you are giving advice. So th there's no money exchange with these these webinars. It's just a case of three blokes that are on having a chat um, and, and trying to educate the market. We don't like to push our propositions, but ultimately if anyone does need tax advice or does want to link up with someone who is suitably qualified and knows their stuff inside out, then speak to John and speak to John's firm because, again, uh, they're phenomenal. The next session is in two months' time, so there'll be um, information sent out shortly, but please do attend, please do join. The election will have happened by then, so God knows um, what position we're going to be in. Um, but I'm sure there'll be a lot, a lot for John to update us on in the taxation world. And if more than anything, you'll, you'll just get to ask us questions again. But gents, um, if you want to say your quick goodbyes, then I'll wrap it up. But from me, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. It's almost half past 11. It is coming home. I must add that it is coming home. Um, but yeah, thank you both for joining and thank you for all attendees. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week, and we'll catch you all soon. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.